Okay. All right. Will do. Hey, good morning, everybody. Um, so, oh, I need to do this. Okay. Um, see, this is now. Okay, um, so I've got to stay here, frozen in place. Um, so I wasn't quite sure what to present um, at this uh, meeting, but I think that especially given what Stephanie will be talking about later on this afternoon, where she's presenting some results about how looking at the archeological record can inform our current thinking about how to go forward, I thought it might be worth presenting some uh, results that I did several years ago now um, with uh, my uh, great collaborators there, Mike Price, Tim Kohler, Brendan Tracy, um, Hajimo Shamao, and J. Wan Shin, um, on looking at a data set that was actually collected by somebody else, Peter Turchin, who's um, somewhat of a controversial figure, um, and analyzing it a bit more carefully. There were comments made this morning about you know, the old platitude that um, all models are wrong, but some are useful. There are some important consequences of taking that kind of message to heart that I'll be presenting in this talk. And if there's time remaining at the end, I would like to basically point um, at a bunch of um, approaches, a bunch of mathematical tools that um, Stephanie is also involved with that, have, that would provide, hopefully, a way, um, we think, to go much, much more, um, uh, much, much more sophisticated in terms of these analyses and could also be applied uh, far, far more wild, uh, widely. Um, okay, and so uh, I'm actually more comfortable if people ask me questions during the talk, so long as it doesn't get out of hand. Um, so if there's anything here that's not very clear, um, uh, please let me know. So um, first off, um, uh, Peter Turchin with um, a, a group of about 51 other archeologists got together about five years ago to collect a data set, to um, uh, create a data set by collecting data that extends over 10,000 years, all six inhabited continents, all civilizations, and just start analyzing it. Ultimately, he, um, Peter does have motivated reasoning. He's got a re he has a hypothesis about what is driving history that he wanted to use this data to actually confirm he, and he's recently come out a, you know, with a paper in Science Advances that's using a little bit more sophisticated, a little bit more um, updated version of this data set, where that's one of the major lessons that he is drawing. But credit where credit is due, this um, project, this data set that he um, uh, curated and brought together is an amazing thing, and they did a very good first statistical analysis but there's a lot of um, extra things that one can discern um, from the data, and that's what we'll be talking about today. So first, I'm going to go into what this data is, and then later on, I'm going to be talking about a more this uh, out more information from this data. Here's the PNAS paper. As you can see, as I promised, it's about 50, I think, 51 maybe, um, uh, archaeologists. These are people who had expertise in different specific civilizations in different times. So one of them is an um, expert in the Khmer civilization, for example. Um, another one is an expert in um, uh, Peru, ancient Peruvian civilizations. There's another one who's an expert in Latium, the Latium plain, and so on and so forth. So they, um, there was a uh, consensus reached on how exactly to quantify a set of about 45 characteristics of the civilization that is their expertise. Every single one of them came up with these 45 numbers for the civilization that's their expertise, and then the data was brought together. And um, the res these are the um, civilizations. There were a total of 30 that they um, ended up uh, putting it together into this data. You can see here are their locations all across the planet. And what they did was they took the original, there was what they called those um, natural geographic areas. Um, there's lots of crude attempts to correct for statistical biases and how they formed this data set in the first place. 
they threw out a lot of data to try to actually make there be things like uniform coverage. To a Bayesian, to someone who's anal retentive about such things like I am, you never ever, no matter what, throw out data. All data is at worst useless, but if you're careful in your statistics, it'll never actually be something that you don't want to know about. But in any case, um, it makes sense, to be quite honest, for a first approach, like they did. So they settled on those um, uh, 30 National Geographic areas, which we just showed you. 100-year um, time slices um, from the beginning of agriculture, um, uh, as, not, as far back as 9600 BCE, depending on the actual um, polity in question, to very, very close to the modern period. Um, and so what you had here, it's very, very important, is longitudinal data sets. It's not cross-sectional, it's longitudinal. You can watch different civilizations. The reason that's so important is that different civilizations, so to speak, had different birthdays. So if you just take a cross-section of a group of people who have very, very different ages and try to discern something about the dynamics of an individual um, human's lifetime, you're basically screwed. You want to be able to track individual humans and that's what they were doing in this data set. And they called it the um, Seshat data set. They, um, one thing that they did, I think it's on this next slide. Um, uh, uh, let's see, yes. So they took the uh, 51 uh, different variables and they then, here's one of the first hacks, they actually collapsed them down to what they called nine complexity characteristics. These were the nine variables that they then um, sent into their subsequent statistical analysis. And you can see here what those nine variables are. So for example, in infrastructure, there were a bunch of binary va um, variables. Um, uh, and like, do you have markets or not? Um, do you have full food storage or not? But a lot of these variables actually had small number of numeric um, values. For example, it could be ports. How big was your port? Um, irrigation, different ways of, of quantifying the sophistication of the irrigation, and so on and so forth. They had substantial problems that they had to finesse because um, a lot of, there were things like um, not only choosing which um, national geographic areas to ignore, as I mentioned, but also to deal with missing data. They, no civilization can you actually fill all 51 variables through all these one century time slices. So they use a technique that's standard in statistics but is frankly junk called imputations. Um, and what I'll be pointing to at the end of the talk, hopefully, is how you can use um, fitting of data sets with the Langevin dynamics that completely circumvents that issue. So anyway, um, then the, okay, so here's the, the way that they started. Um, I, I can carp about it, but the truth be told, it's a very reasonable first pass of what you're going to be doing with this data set, all these decisions that they made. Um, then they got a result which, frankly, I was 100% convinced has to be wrong. Every historian ever knows that this is junk, but it was true. They did just a principal component analysis, the dumbest possible thing you can do to the entire data set in the space of uh, nine complexity characteristics. And they found that the uh, first principal component, so to people who don't know, that's just you're fitting a single Gaussian to your data. And the first principal component, the major ellipse of this Gaussian, um, which is actually about equally loaded on all of those nine complexity characteristics, so it's not just ending up being one of them, it explains over 70% of all the variability. So you can just look at that one direction in nine-dimensional space, essentially point to yourself, and this is like a historian's version of that T-shirt with a picture of the Milky Way galaxy saying, you are here. You can just point to where you are on that one axis and say, this is where your civilization is. And civilizations all moved from low PC1 values, from low values of that principal component, to higher ones. Absurd. This is like the revenge of Toynbee or something like that. Everybody knows this can't be true. So the first thing that I did was I tried to dive into the data and find mistakes, but it's legit. Um, here's, as I say, the loading of that first um, principal component in the nine-dimensional space. Um, here is some cross-validation kinds of things that they did. Uh, one of the um, rather powerful natural experiments, as economists um, uh, would talk about instrumental variables, is something called the Atlantic Ocean. You can compare New World to Old World. 
and in these um, uh, times that this data is collected from, you're pretty sure that they were completely independent. And you can actually see that the same phenomena is going on in the new world and the old world. So this is actually human civilizations. The experiment was done twice. Okay, um, let's see what we got here. Yep, that's as I was just saying, the um, held out data for in the uh, North America. And for those of you who are history junkies, um, uh, it's actually, you can just spend it, um, hours and hours looking at the actual data and what it's showing. So here are just some examples to sort of whet your appetite. Um, uh, here's the years, and here is that principal component, that first one that explains almost everything. And here is Upper Egypt and the Middle Yellow River Valley. And as you can see, there are obviously fluctuations. And here are some other civilizations. Um, uh, Susiana, the Kachi Plain, I think that's actually um, Kyoto, Nara. Um, Latium, that's, um, uh, I'm not sure if it contains where we are right now, but it's certainly Rome. Sogdiana, so Oxus River civilization and so on. And as you can see, there are many major fluctuations down. Um, fluctuations, well, whether they're fluctuations or not. There are many um, dips downward in PC1 with time. So it's not that PC1 exactly equals time, but nonetheless, it does seem to be something that basically you can view it as a measure of the complexity of a civilization. You know, this is something that sociologically you are not supposed to say that one society is more developed than another one. But to be quite honest, the PC1 value plays that role a lot. How am I doing here for time? Okay. So, and here's just um, uh, how they go with time. All right. So um, now I'm going to be taking those results of Peter's, which, um, so I went through this paper, confirmed that, boy, it really does seem to be legit. How can we take it further? So, principal component analysis. Here is an example. It's a simple sine wave. And if you were to do a principal component analysis, so you're going to try to fit that data with a single Gaussian, you will find that the first principal component is this red line, and the second one is the green line. This red line is going to um, explain almost all the variability. You'll be pretty sure that, yep, this is just a single Gaussian. Notice that you're missing a hell of a lot of important structure. So, okay, given that, um, what were, um, do we actually maybe have this kind of a structure underlying the PCA, underlying the, uh, da the SESHA data set? Yes, we do. This is um, PC2. This is the second most important principal component. And this is PC1. It actually looks just like that sine wave. This is the data. We have a sliding window here. That's what these error bars are reflecting. And you can see all civilizations. This is um, uh, our history, folks. We seem to be going down in PC2 as we grow in PC1. Then we hit this point, a hinge point, we called it. And you uh, now start increasing, and then you start going down again. OK. Um, uh, well, what's going on? Notice this is all model free, really, in a certain sense. Or um, to put it another way to, um, again, point to that earlier talk, um, this is taking the original model, which is a single Gaussian, and saying, well, not only is it wrong, it also might be a little bit misleading. Let's go into the data a little bit more. But it's still model free in the sense that there's no, at, at this point, what I've shown you so far, there's no underlying thesis about this is the way human cultures work. This is just raw collecting of the data. Matteo? Sorry, David. So how much uh, uh, variance does the PC2 explain? How, um, how much does it explain after the PC1? Yeah. Um, let's see. I don't know the number of hand. It would go back to this right there. Um, so this is the amount that's explained, and so PC1 is up there, just under 70%. PC2 is actually very, very close to a bunch of the other PCs, okay? All right, so at uh, this point, I've not said anything about humans, really. This is just raw time series analysis. This could have to do with populations of frogs in a pond or, or what, what have you. And that's not completely glib, by the way. Hakapo and I have been talking off and on about um, applying some of these techniques to ecosystem modeling. Um, but now I'm going to actually dive into some uh, social science kinds of hypothesizing about what's going on here. So 
Well, let's look at those nine complexity characteristics. These are the, um, this is what they are for the top two PC components. This is the uh, population of the polity, the territory of the polity, the uh, population of the capital, the number of levels of the government, the government type, and so on. And then over here is the infrastructure, how developed it is, writing, there's various kinds of writing all the way up to ultimately, um, I think they was listed here as the most sophisticated writing would be alphabets. But um, how widespread texts are, money, there's of course many kinds. The most, quote, primitive money is barter. Um, you can end up going all the way to fiat money, um, uh, thanks to uh, Yuan China civilization. Or actually, I think it was Tang, but in any case. And uh, so here actually is the answer directly to uh, Mateo's question, 77% of the variability and a 6%. Now, if you look at what these are, I'm going to be very, very crudely refer to these ones here. These have to do with the information processing in the polity, in the civilization. These ones have to do with just how damn big it is, how fat that polity is. So this one is sometimes called in archaeology scale. It's called a scalar value, um, not to be confused with what everybody else would mean by the word scalar. And this one, um, sort of uh, expanding a little bit beyond what the um, true data necessarily justifies, we're going to be referring to this as the computational capabilities of the civilization. It's how much information processing it can actually do. Viewing a civilization as a computer, in essence. Um, okay. So um, given that there's these two values here, notice, by the way, PC2 flips from having negative loading on the first components to having positive loading over there. Moreover, because PC1 is positive, and by definition, PC2 must be orthogonal, we know it has to be that case. So it's got to be the case that as PC1 is going up, some PC2 um, components are going down and other ones are going up. And if you use that and apply it to this particular data set, here is the actual sum of, uh, uh, of the PC2 components. And here is just looking at the negative loading ones and the positive loading ones. So what we're seeing here, to um, uh, interpret this for you, is that up until this point right here, the, um, uh, the sky's characteristics of the polity are increasing without much change in the information processing capabilities. You're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but you're still a dumbass. Eventually, you get up to a sufficient hinge point, a threshold, and all of a sudden you say, wait, now I'm actually pretty big. The causality, who knows, it might be that you can't grow bigger without developing more information processing capabilities, or maybe only now are you able to, but whatever, you tend to stop growing physically but instead start developing greater and greater information processing capabilities. Your computer stops just adding more and more slow memory, and now it's getting a bunch of GPUs added to it. Until eventually you get up to a sufficiently sophisticated um, uh, information processing capability, and now you can start growing and getting fatter and fatter again. That's us. That's humans, folks. Who knows what it would be with some alien civilization, but that seems to be us, and who knows why this is happening. But this is just what the data seems to be saying, the minimal modeling. There's many, many other patterns in this data. This is actually the data shown, the, uh, the uh, time series. This is PC2, this is PC1. These are all, the, it's color-coded. The color is just to try to distinguish the trajectories of the different polities. But there's all kinds of um, uh, properties in this data set. First of all, notice that there's huge regions of PC1, PC2 space where nobody's there. Why? What's wrong about those regions of PC1, PC2 space? Also, notice here's PC1, and so time tends to be going left to right. What seems to be happening, and this can actually be quantified now with techniques I'm not going to be showing here, is that societies all start to spread apart. But then they start to, to use a biological term, they start to canalize. Over here, it seems like everybody's getting on the same highway, and we're all going in the exact same direction, and we're converging to the same spot. And interestingly, these are the two hinge points. So this is the one where you um, now start um, developing information processing capabilities, and you start going everybody in all which directions. And then once you have sufficient information processing capabilities, 
everybody starts homogenizing. And of course, this is all, there have been many, many things rem uh, remarked in this talk about things like loss of language diversity worldwide and so on and so forth. That's all part and parcel of this kind of a trend in human civilization and in that case of the global scale. Okay, but other things to notice, these patterns they hold are mostly for old world societies. Those are the blue ones. New world societies, it's not so clear that they do. This might be the fact because to use very, very loaded language, new world societies never actually got as developed as old world societies. They never got over here in the PC1 space, but that's to be determined. These are the kinds of things one can start to actually tease out of the data. Yes. Thank you. So as you asked for questions during the talk and you just said new world societies never got as civilized as old world ones, how about things like the Aztec and Mayan societies okay, which were shown you. to be thank enormously okay, complex? Very, very I flipped through that. Let me be more careful in my language. The new world societies that are recorded in the Seshat data set. Um, so this is actually things like uh, Oaxaca and I think Monte Alban. Um, Inca was not here. Um, Tenochtitlan is not in here. Teotihuacan is not in here. I think the Maya were. The Maya were, in fact. Yes, I'm sure of that. But that's about the extent of it. So based on the data that you have, and given that you're seeing that dissimilarity, how representative do you think these patterns genuinely are of all trends if you know that they're not representing all stages of development in these societies? So, very, very good, and this gets to the issue that I was um, emphasizing before, you never ever throw out data. They did because they wanted to try to get essentially uniform coverage over the world, and they also want to try to pick early stage, middle stage, and late stage, what they going in before even analyzing the data viewed as early, middle, and late stage civilizations. So they just did that as a first pass to try to de-bias it, because obviously there's a hell of a lot more data in, say, Latium than there is in, say, something like Sub-Sahara Africa. Um, so completely. And, and there's, uh, well, I'll try to point to at the end of the talk, how long, how much time do I have? I have 20 minutes, okay. And I'll try to point at the end of the talk, there are some techniques that have been developed in machine learning. Um, let me actually, actually point to it now. Um, do you know what Fokker-Planck dynamics is, Langevin dynamics, stochastic differential equations? Okay, stochastic processes. There have been some techniques that have been developed in machine learning recently on fully Bayesian approaches to actually fitting a Fokker-Planck dynamics, so a stochastic process, to a data set where you can have missing data, you can have completely, you can have missing fields, you can have all the data in there, you don't, it's, there are no biases that come in by having extra data points. This is very, very powerful machinery. Um, well, very, very importantly, the Fokker-Planck dynamics the uh, what's called stochastic differential equation, it is not varying in time, but it's allowed to vary in space. So it's allowed to vary across this entire system here. And that is the proper way to address your questions and a whole hell of a lot as well. Um, but that's not here and it's also not in this paper um, where we did this initial analysis. So that's probably more than you want to know, but nonetheless. Uh, David, maybe just one other question. So why do you call this second component information? It looks like it's a, it's a measure of the amount of interaction or exchanges that are occurring within um, the population. Well, I don't, I don't know. It look, one could see that it is. I mean, these are certainly, if you do want to view a society as a computer, and insert here all the cliches about how every um, uh, scientific era likes to view um, other physical systems in terms of whatever the sexy thing is in that scientific era. And so viewing societies as computers is maybe a silly thing to do. But nonetheless, if you do want to do it, this makes sense as this is the information processing capability. If you have an alphabet, your writing system is, first of all, there's going to be much, much greater literacy. And in general, you're going to have many, many more kinds of text. Early writing, pre-alphabetic writing, was first only scribal classes could ever read it, 
or write it. So it's a very, very limited part of your actual society. Moreover, there's in many early societies um, where you were, uh, had very, very early scripts, most of what was written was actually just um, bookkeeping. There was almost nothing in terms of um, what we would consider uh, either the sciences or the arts because it was very, very practically oriented. Um, that's not completely true, for example, Chinese, um, uh, Chinese calligra calligraphy. That, that actually originated by divining the future, by looking at cracks in the shells of tortoises and things like this. But by and large, for example, the more sophisticated the writing, the far greater it is possible to actually use writing for society as a whole to develop itself. Some people say that Gutenberg's printing press is one of the most important inventions ever because it basically unleashed the virus of uh, the, 50, of the uh, uh, early um, European version of what we would now call the internet revolution. That once you had the printing press, literacy was now much more widely um, distributed. Many, many more texts could be written. You didn't have to have these silly monks and um, monasteries um, uh, writing down things very, very tediously. This was a similar thing. So, and that's true for uh, money, certainly, as well. One of the major um, uses an economist will tell you of money is to try to essentially be a Hayekian um, uh, construct that allows the market to be the computer and so on. If you don't have fiat money, if you just got barter money, you're not going to really be getting there. So it does make sense, I think, to view these as whether that's the reason they're important or not, who knows. But they are actually um, uh, variables that enable a information processing um, abilities of the actual society. So, I mean, I've got a lot of questions around these that can wait for later. You stated that the information spreading often comes in when societies reach a certain size. And obviously, I mean, I think of the Victorian era and when we started to evolve ways of dealing with waste, well, this is all way before oh, the yeah. Victorian era. But what it makes me think of is some of these ancient societies collapse because of what we think may be related to disease and pandemics. There is evidence to suggest that for some of the Latin American civilizations and the Kaima civilization. Has it ever been examined to see if there is a lack of information transfer when they hit that si uh, significant size that you actually see other factors coming in that could lead to the extinction of those societies? So there are many things that can happen to a society in a di that do not have to do with just directly these variables. For example, volcanic eruptions, um, uh, uh, pandemics coming through the Justinian plague. Um, take your pick. Um, thera erupting, um, uh, maybe or maybe not, having to do with the collapse of the Minoan civilization. One of the things that the stochastic process modeling techniques provide is the following. I can look at a data set, fit it with a stochastic process. Say that, okay, look at this particular event right here, though. How probable would it have been under this long-term stochastic process that seems to, gen to um, govern the dynamics of human civilizations? If the answer is very, very improbable, then that is great evidence that you've got an external perturbation on your system. So I, th that's not the subject of this talk, but going to stochastic process modeling where everything is probabilistic is extremely powerful. There's lots of things you can do with it. Some of them are to address the very, very question that you just raised. Unknown unknowns, when are they actually, what big glitches um, seem to be due to the unknown unknowns in the sense of not being recorded in the data set, okay? All right, so, um, yeah. Sorry? Oh, um, uh, probably the way that they um, uh, normalize their, their numbers. I don't know, I'd have to go back and dig into it. Um, there are, whenever you dive into data sets, you always find there are going to be some glitches. And I should say, that Seshat, in this recent Science Advances paper, they um, have uh, developed it further. There's now more than 51 variables, and they got a lot of pushback, mostly from archaeologists. There were big fights. 
um, about the way that they were collecting their data and so on. And basically, they won those fights. But nonetheless, they've modified a lot on um, how they are assigning numbers in like Seshat version two. Um, let me actually give you an example of a fight. And um, in the small amount of time I have left. So this is an interesting topic in almost sociology of science. There has been this hypothesis kicked around, and Joe Heinrich and others are one of the major proponents, that a necessary condition for a society to get sufficiently complex is that you have to have a religion based upon moralizing high gods. Um, it's tied up with people who believe in things like the axial age, which, by the way, is junk. Um, uh, Peter Turchin actually has a great paper that he just basically takes that to shreds. The notion of, a, of why a moralizing high god is necessary is the following. It kind of makes sense as a cartoon. Go back to the uh, standard deities, you know, say Greco-Roman deities. These were essentially um, uh, Zeus, Apollo, all of them, uh, the dudes and a couple of the dudettes. They were all really just powerful humans in all ways, shapes, and forms. And for you to actually um, get them to look uh, kindly upon you and to benefit you, you just had to offer up enough sheep and cattle and maybe um, uh, get yourself sufficiently stoned in some of the Pythian caves and this, that, and the other. And that's how it is that you went through life and um, did your religion. Moralizing gods, the Abrahamic religions, um, no notionally some of the uh, Hindu deities, and if you want to actually say Hinduism is a religion, um, uh, uh, potentially you could view Buddhism this way. Um, the moralizing gods said, no, 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 none of that. For you to actually get the benefits of the religious realm, you've got to be moral and good. Why would, might this make um, uh, any kind of difference? The cartoon is that, well, if everybody is now being incentivized to be good, rather than just um, uh, chop up enough of their um, firstborn sheep, that means that they are much more likely to actually have engage in reciprocal altruism. They are going to be much nicer to people that they don't happen to personally know if they think that you're being watched by the big dude in the sky who's going to really slam on you if you're not nice to people just because they happen to be from a different tribe. That's the cartoon. Peter, and so as I say, um, uh, Joe Heinrich and many others um, uh, were saying that this is in fact true, that you need to have moralizing high gods before you can have a jump in complexity in civilizations. Um, Peter, I understand why he did this. I would have as well, or I would have possibly. He was very, very eager to mine the Sesha data set just after it came out. So he um, actually came up with a uh, nature paper. He and his, um, it was published in Nature, um, Nature, Nature, not Nature, Human Behavior. It was later they had to actually retract it. But um, uh, for, for other reasons besides this one, what they tried to do is to use the Sesha data set to address this question. Are moralizing high gods a precondition for societies to uh, have a jump in, comp in complexity? The way that they tried to do it is that for each society in Seshat, they did a simple time series analysis of the PC1 values to find the large jumps, interpreted those as jumps of complexity, and then said, well, did they precede the onset of moralizing gods? And they concluded, in fact, that moralizing gods always occur after a jump in complexity. So the causal arrow, they said, is, is it anything the other direction? OK, well, um, we've got other measures of complexity here. Besides just PC1, we realize that, well, we can actually use these hinge points as measures of complexity. So let's see what that says. Because there's actually a major statistics flaw in what Peter et al. were doing in that nature paper. In order to actually um, uh, carry out their program of doing this time series analysis, you need to have PC1 data on society from before the onset of moralizing gods to after. To do that, you have to, and so what they did, throwing out um, data that's um, all over the place, they excluded societies from their analysis where they didn't have such data. This is very statistically biased because um, it's basically going to be much more, societies that had the moralizing god onset much more recently 
are much more likely to um, satisfy those conditions. It was realizing this that led us to say, well, maybe we can use the hinge points instead. And so what we found, come on, um, it's stuck. Not sure why, but it doesn't want to move. I don't know why. Okay. So um, anyway, as I was saying, um, our alternative that we investigated was to see whether PC1F society has reached its first hinge point. That's how we are assessing its social complexity and see where the moralizing God onset is compared to that. Anybody here want to make predictions of what we found? Basically, moralizing gods are irrelevant. There's too much other stuff going on. Not completely irrelevant. Presumably they have some role to play. But here's what we found. Remember the first hinge point's right about there. And there we found that there are some onsets of moralizing gods that are before the first hinge point, and some of them are after. You know, maybe you might want to say that there's more after than before, but you would have to be careful about um, uh, your statistical biases and when you can actually measure the onset of moralizing gods. But to a first pass, no, it's just a nice cartoon, but it's not really got anything to do with anything. Okay, so uh, many, many other things to go through. I should probably start to finish up. Okay, let me skip this. There are, no surprise, some statistical artifacts we found um, having to do with their use of imputations. One thing that I should point out is um, it's actually a very subtle kind of a stochastic process. In this kind of a data set, there's actually two stochastic processes that you're going to be see that's going to be going on. One of them is just the dynamics. If I'm a civilization and I'm here in my uh, uh, non-complexity characteristics, where am I likely to go in the future? That's the dynamic stochastic process. But especially because, remember, this is longitudinal. That's a big power of this data set, rather than just being cross-sectional. There's another very, very important stochastic process, which is when were you born? And presumably, um, you, you look early, very early, the probability of any given civilization being born then is very, very small, and it grows with time. These two stochastic processes come together to actually distort the kind of data sets you see. We found that, in fact, it looked like there were two Gaussians. Remember, PCA assumes a single Gaussian. We thought that there, well, my God, if you look at the data, it looks like there's actually two Gaussians, and maybe it's a mixture model. But then when we really um, dug into it, we saw that because of these two stochastic processes going on, you could get a pretty crude fit to it by just modeling the birth process plus a simple Markov chain dynamic. So it, these kinds of issues, the stochastic processes going on here are very subtle. Where, the, where do we go from here? That's pretty much the end of what I've got to present here. As I mentioned, we, um, me and uh, some collaborators, and I've been talking with Hakapo and so on about applying this to other data sets, like microeconomic data and so on. Why is any of this relevant to this conference? Based upon what we, um, uh, our experiences in analyzing SESHAT, we've now taken these tools that have been developed in machine learning, which allow you to be a much more first principle, much more powerful stochastic process analysis of a data set, where you can do things like detect, was there a perturbation from outside the system? Another kind of thing that you can do, asking very loaded questions, is it a good model to say that India right now is just where Japan was 30 years behind? We can actually start to address those kinds of questions. You can actually apply these kinds of techniques that we're developing to macro system, dyna to macroeconomic dynamics, 
You can also apply it to climate dynamics. Basically, it's very, very agnostic modeling, fully Bayesian, where you don't put any interpretation in. And yes, every model is only an approximation. No model is exactly correct. But there's lots of um, great powers of using some of these more recent techniques to actually do the analysis rather than a conventional time series, delay embedding time series where you would need massive amounts of data to get anywhere. So um, I'll end it there. Since Thanks, David. Very interesting talk. So many, you know, such the whole, whole arc of history there. Um, first of all, I really like to hear that you said you're thinking of applying this to ecosystem data as well, too, because our work in ecosystems are that they go from stages of growth and scalar increase to development and focusing on information and all of that. So that I see that fitting very nicely with that, which then brings me back to the, those nine characteristics. None of them were natural resources based. And um, that seems to be a problem, unless it's just implicit that the city couldn't start unless it already had something like that. But it would be nice to maybe try to consider that as well. Oh, one yeah. Of the it's a big problem. Um, <laughs> there are many, many things to go forward with this whole approach. People should be joining. I mean, that's one kind of a thing that could come out of this kind of a meeting. Have people with data sets in all kinds of fields related to sustainability throw it all together, get it into one big data set that you could then just use stochastic process fitting to that data set and just see what the hell comes out. You'll be able to see, I expect fully, just like the hinge points, which we didn't anticipate, that there would be things that we don't anticipate about climate human behavior interactions. Almost guaranteed, there are things that nobody in this room is thinking of that are actually very important that such a data set would actually uncover for you. And something I should actually emphasize that's so powerful about these new techniques if you go to anybody who's an expert right now in nonlinear time series analysis, based upon delay embedding, it's called, if people are familiar with this, ARMA models or um, autoregressive models are a linear version of this. To be able to um, uh, do any kind of a reasonable fit to something and say even just a nine dimensional space, you would need probably, well, it depends, but on the order of hundreds of thousands of data points. To do it with these recent techniques, because it amounts to assuming that you've got a Markovian dynamics that is allowed to vary across your space, the Seshet data set, none of the time series is contained more than several tens of data points. So especially when you're data poor, or just anything other than hugely data rich, these new techniques that these people have been developing are extraordinarily powerful. They should be used in essentially all sciences, I would think, um, uh, rather than or in, in addition to standard nonlinear time series analysis. In addition to the fact that they can tell you things like external perturbations and you don't need to use imputations to deal with missing data and just it's a win, 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 win. City characteristics. Okay, just as a follow-up question to this one. So all your analysis depend on basically this predetermined, pre-specified nine complexity characteristics, right? Can we ever imagine, you know, having a society to develop to and you know information to, to a point where you have such information present capacity that you have so many more complexity classes? So basically just can we even study or talk about emergence of a new complexity characteristics or something like that? Um or are we sure that these are actually, you know, constructing well societies and it's just done? There's, I've done a lot of work in my day on Bayesian modeling, machine learning for customers, business customers, um, or engineering customers, like when I was at NASA. There are several mantras. One of them is you never throw out data. The other one is you're not going to get very far without trying to use domain experts, quote unquote, people who really know what the things mean. Don't be full of yourself, you nerd scientist. These are people, exploit them. They really know what they're talking about. Sometimes they're wrong, but really you've got to understand them. 
That's in essence what was done here. It was domain experts who came up with those nine complexity characteristics. You could have alternatively just worked in the 51 dimensional space directly. They didn't want to do a PCA in that 51 dimensional space. But what you should probably be doing is not PCA, you should be doing what's called manifold learning. Um, you could even imagine using what's called topological data analysis. If you were to do something like manifold learning to actually just find what is the, low, the uh, lower dimensional manifold that everything reduces to, these are the important ones, and then look at the dynamics there, one could very easily imagine that certain things are emergent. You would need to be sure that whatever is emerging is not being, it has to be at least somehow captured in the data set. There was nothing in these data sets that said, does this civilization have the internet or not? If you don't have that in your data set, you're not gonna be able to see the onset of the internet. But nonetheless, you could very easily imagine things like these complexity characteristics, which are a weird kind of a statistical hack, change with time, one could imagine. How, um, how sensitive are these results to some methodological changes, like if you change the imputation method or if you, um, read, if you use a different way of standardizing some variables or if you exclude some variables rather than others? You know, when you, when you up, study these data sets, you have to take tons of uh, methodological choice. Has anybody, do you have a sense of how robust are, you know, if you, are the end results uh, to yep. the variation of these choices? So Peter used cross-validation. And I am a very, very firm believer. Um, I think that's the under, well, difference um, our presentation would be that cross-validation is really the scientific method, I would say, quantified, made formal. He used that with things like the Atlantic Ocean, as I mentioned. So that is one version of testing exactly what you're saying. If you are, one of the advantages, if one wants to, we're going to view it that way, of having these nine complexity characteristics is that if you throw out one of your 51 variables, you'll still have nine complexity characteristics. The, also, the fact that the PC1 was equally loaded on those nine complexity characteristics means that even if you got rid of one of those nine complexity characteristics, PC1 would still be aiming in uh, pretty much the same direction. That being said, no civilization um, I had a complete history without any gaps in the data. Archaeological data is just very, very um, holy, so to speak, in a, a couple of senses. And so they did use these ugly things called linear imputations. Very, very hideous. And they weren't aware of it, but it introduced statistical artifacts. You can see them right here. This was, we were trying to figure out why the two Gaussian peaks and so then we, um, did, we went into really d a deep dive into their data, which they had pre-processed with these imputations, which are a very ugly way of trying to fill in missing fields. And we noticed these streaks. We concluded that these streaks are not themselves directly relevant. Um, but nonetheless, they are there. One of the advantages to keep on evangelizing of uh, using these new stochastic process models is that it would be very robust against these kinds of things. It's Bayesian all the way through. So not only do I get a stochastic process, but I also tell you how confident you should be in the parameters of that process. David, just quickly, I wish we didn't use the word complexity in any of this, but that's an aside. Okay. But I, um, the, I mean, what you're finding is this peculiar collapse of dimensionality, right? And is that a sort of operational definition of a civilization where all its various factors become correlated? Um, in essence, that's what the mat, if they had used, or, or we should, anybody who's got the resources, to be quite honest, to be blunt about it, um, which I right now don't, to go after this should do, is something like manifold learning, where one would see exactly what you're saying, what you're um, uh, pointed to. Where, you, where we would see, as you know, all of the data, it really, it's not spread out. I mean, notice and recall that I said one of the big mysteries way back here was um, uh, how come there are all these gaps? Well, if, we, if you look at things in nine-dimensional space, 
there's going to be presumably much larger regions. Um, uh, this, this is going to be some kind of a weird sheet in that nine-dimensional space. And that is exactly um, reflective of the kinds of collapsing of all these different um, features down to actually only one underlying variable. Here's another way of putting it. The, the physicist in me, and there is still a little bit of one, um, wanted to be able to take this dynamics and to be honest, try to actually model it as though it's actually a physics system where you use what's called a Hemholtz decomposition to say, can we view this as like a gravitational field with all the societies are being moved with noise according to that gravitational potential? Turns out it doesn't quite work but that's essentially, it would amount to what would be so cool by that kind of thing, which is related to what you were saying, is that we would then discover, this would be like Kepler, we would be discovering the laws that govern human society dynamics purely from the data. It would then be some kind of Newton further down the road who would figure out the why, but we would exact, or Tycho Brahe, I guess, would be better than, analogy than Kepler. We would then actually be discovering by doing exactly what you're saying, what the dynamic laws are that seem to govern humans. In, in a certain sense, in a certain sense. Okay, thank you very much, David. Okay, thank you. I think uh, we need to move to...